I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Sono New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. This month, we're going to take you into Elmhurst, Queens, a community where nearly two-thirds of the population come from other countries. More than half of the largely working-class neighborhood is Latino and a quarter Asian. Like many communities we've visited, the area that the New York Times once called a crossroads of the world is now at a crossroads itself. The neighborhood's low prices and proximity to the subway is making it a hotspot for New Yorkers moving out of Manhattan. But recently, Elmhurst has been a hotspot of another kind, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. On this episode, life support, how hospital closures in central Queens left a lone Elmhurst facility to ferociously battle COVID-19. Invisible immigrants, the impact of COVID on undocumented immigrants in communities like Elmhurst. And counting on NYC, a multi-million dollar push for New Yorkers to fill out the census during this health crisis. Those stories and more coming up on Diverse City. Apocalyptic, beleaguered, those are just a few words media reports have used to describe Elmhurst Hospital as it's become a symbol of how COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on New York's medical system. Elmhurst Hospital serves some of the zip codes with the highest number of COVID cases. It's also the only hospital serving more than 1.5 million people in a vast stretch of north central western Queens. Robert Pozoricki is editor-in-chief of AM New York and former editor of the Queen's Courier. He recently wrote an article for AM New York about the closure of three hospitals in the area 11 years ago that left Elmhurst Hospital in the proverbial lurch. He discussed that story with us. I think a lot of factors that have come into place are, are kind of converging at this crisis. If you had to draw a north to south border in Queens, right, and you started from LaGuardia, and you follow the Grand Central Parkway down, and then the Van Wyck Expressway down. You're talking about three, four hospitals, if you include Jamaica, for half of the entire borough of Queens. When the three hospitals we, I mentioned in the story closed about 11 years ago, that kind of compounded everything because when you had Elmhurst Hospital work and, and you had St. John's nearby and that was open, um, and you had Parkway and Forest Hills when that was operating, they were alleviating pressure off each other. Both St. John's and Parkway were massively in debt. St. John's almost went into bankruptcy along with Mary Immaculate and other hospitals within the St. Vincent's Catholic Medical Center's chain in 2006. This is a time before Obamacare. So you had a lot of uninsured patients seeking treatment and not having the ability to pay for it. Hospital never turned the, the clients away. Um, <clears throat> you had health insurance providers, which is still a problem today, being slow in terms of reimbursing hospitals for the care they provided, Medicare, Medicaid, those payments are slow to, to uh, come into uh, to the hospitals. And it left the hospitals saddled with massive debt. Parkway, as I recall, was in a similar situation. And uh, Parkway was the first to go. A few months later, St. John's and Mary Immaculate followed. So after St. John's and Mary Immaculate closed in 2009, uh, Parkway had closed in 2008, Elmhurst was really the only me major medical center for the Elmhurst area, Corona, Jackson Heights, Woodside, Maspeth, Middle Village. And they saw an immediate increase in the emergency room visits. Now they had been managing that. Um, I think the uh, passes for the Affordable Care Act helped in terms of providing more health insurance, uh, improving compensation for hospitals. The advent of the urgent care center, those being opened up, that also kind of took strain off of the hospitals in general. But they were still pretty overwhelmed, as far as I understand, at Helmhurst. And they were planning a major emergency department expansion in the past, you know, past few months. It was supposed to get underway this spring, and then the coronavirus pandemic hit. Can you look back on it now that just a few months after St. John's and Mary Immaculate Parkway closed, all of a sudden Queens gets hit with a swine flu epidemic? 
it was not as virulent as coronavirus. But as the Times Ledger reported, it was one of our sister papers, Elmhurst immediately got overcrowded with patients. So that was kind of like the harbinger, you know, the, the sign that, you know, the loss of the hospitals was, was, gonna, was finally being felt. Um, and that if nothing was done soon to kind of remedy this, that it would get worse if, in case, you know, there would be another pandemic. And now here we are. I think the only way out of this down the line, and maybe this is something that can be talked about when the dust finally settles on coronavirus, the borough really needs additional hospital space. It needs more than urgent care centers. It needs places where people can go in a situation like this or just any other situation and get local health care. They don't have to be massive hospitals, but there's certainly a need for them. At least one healthcare professional is hoping that COVID-19 is the wake-up call that the American healthcare system needs. The virus has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color like Elmhurst. In New York, for example, Latinos account for 34% of COVID-related deaths, but only 29% of the population, while African Americans account for 28% of deaths, but make up 22% of the population. I spoke about the issue with Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, a senior advisor at the social justice and health advocacy group, Social Security Works. Dr. Sri Ram is also known as Dr. America, a healthcare justice correspondent for We Act Radio. Why are we seeing such a big impact on communities of color because of, uh, from COVID-19? You know, before coronavirus ever showed up, we were in a pretty unjust situation when it came to American healthcare. 59% of America's uninsured are people of color. And the reason for that is like, there are multiple reasons for it, but a big part of it is that a lot of folks who are uninsured are working at jobs that do not provide any kind of health benefits. If you look at Walmart, you look at Amazon, you look at a lot of the big box stores and a lot of the fast food companies, they have a health plan called go enroll in Medicaid if you are eligible for Medicaid. Otherwise, you have to work for us for nine months, maybe a year, and then we'll see about your health benefits, knowing fully well that it is such intense and difficult work that you know, it, making that nine or 12 month mark is difficult. More often than not, people are, of color are making those really tough false choices between, do I go to the doctor and get this problem checked out do I you know, do the follow-up that the doctor told me to do for this chronic condition like diabetes or chronic lung problems? Or do I save my money? Because after all, I, need to keep, you know, I have to pay rent. I have to pay a utility bill. And you know, week after week, month after month, there are millions of people of color who are making that difficult choice and they, they can't win for losing. So aside from, for instance, making that hard choice as regards to money, the pre-existing conditions in African-American and Hispanic communities, the rates of asthma and diabetes and heart disease are extraordinarily high. Are those some of the pre-existing conditions? You know, the term has become used so much mm -hmm. when dealing with COVID, pre-existing conditions. Are those some of the pre-existing conditions that, are, that make people more susceptible to the virus? If you take a condition like asthma, you have significantly higher rates of asthma among African Americans, Latinx Americans, and our indigenous brothers and sisters. And they have such high rates of this, but not really because of any specific genetic reason, but because they are, are forced to live in substandard housing. They live in, in, in environments that, where the air is simply not as clean. They live near freeways, they live near factories. And so the very air that they breathe is simply, is simply not clean enough to maintain good lung health. And so they have a condition like asthma. Along comes coronavirus, which loves to prey upon even healthy lungs. And it sees sick lungs, and that's an easy target for this virus. And it's easy for it to not just infect, but to wreak havoc when it infects. And so that's why you have these, you know, these tragic situations where even in the nation's capital, 45% of, the, of, the, of DC is African American, but almost 60% of the people dying from COVID-19 as of April 6th 
are African American. Wasn't the Affordable Care Act supposed to help people, you know, minority groups and so forth, address issues such as this, where, you know, they would be provided with health services? The Affordable Care Act did a lot, but there's still a lot that is that that it could not do because it still is built upon a system of healthcare where we are asking people in order to be eligible for something like Medicaid or to be eligible for assistance in the insurance exchanges, we need to know how much do you earn? What do you do for a living and what is your paycheck? What are your financial reserves? And that those questions right there are are tell you that healthcare is not a human right, that healthcare is going to be a privilege. Is COVID-19 the wake-up call that the healthcare system here needs? I hope that this is a moment that is a, is a moral wake-up call, that it's a call to action, that it becomes a, you know, a time for people to summon the courage of their convictions to do better on healthcare. And to really start talking about healthcare as a basic human right and to not continue to tinker around the edges of what can we make a multi-billion dollar insurance industry do? What can we make a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry do? That they have clearly told us they are not willing to be a good faith partner in, in, in public health. The Small Business Development Center at LaGuardia Community College is stepping up its efforts to help clients at a time when they're searching for ways to keep their businesses afloat. We hear more in this report. It has been devastated because COVID-19 has affected the Amherst community extremely hard. Uh, Queens had, you know, an estimated number of, uh, estimated number of 52,000 plus businesses in 2017. Um, it has an increase of 22% since the end of the recession in 2009. More than two-thirds of the businesses had fewer than five employees and 84% had more than 10 employees. So that means they are small businesses. The SPDC uh, was established in 1984 at LaGuardia Community College. They opened in 9-11 as a result of the attacks. The vision of the SBDC is to bring world-class business expertise to a small and medium-sized businesses. Our mission is to provide customized solutions through advisement, education, research, and advocacy for entrepreneurs, innovators, and the small and medium-sized enterprise community. Right now, we have uh, 22 centers in the state and eight centers in New York City, and we are one of the, those eight centers. Uh, we are funded by the Small Business uh, Administration, SBA, uh, the state of New York, and also host um, campuses like SUNY, CUNY, Columbia University, and Pace University. Our small business owners are desperate, trying to find financial support through loans and grants to mitigate the effects of the crisis. Most of these businesses are closed right now, causing a total chaos in their business and personal lives. The most relevant challenges are the time that they are have to wait now for uh, for loans and to be approved and the amount of financial support to be received and also the number of dollars may not be sufficient to operate as usual. Since we are working remotely, actually, you know, from home, we are also uh, doing webinars uh, for our clients so they can understand each, you know, um, process of any loan application regarding the SBA, the SBA uh, injury disaster loan or the PPP, payroll protection program, or any other program that they would like to learn about it, how to apply, how to get the PPP forgiveness, but the SBDC continues supporting its clients by providing information and additional support like grants and other local uh, available uh, resources in the community. Like uh, the city is creating new grants. So we are up to date, you know, trying to find all the grants for women minority. They have one that is excellent. It's called uh, We Buy Black. 
This is for black business own and I love the strategy, it's tremendous. So I have a couple of clients applying for some local grants. Facebook also provides another type of uh, grants. So we identify all those businesses that can get benefits to apply for that grant as well. Google and other uh, digital platforms are offering training house to you. Uh, structure the businesses to, to move online. So we're sharing that information uh, with our client as well. Yes, we are very we are very happy because the second round for the stimulus, which is going to be about uh, $400 billion, uh, uh, this is the second stimulus. So we have the clients waiting for this, uh, you know, to happen. The SBDC will continue providing support to our clients through the course of the uh, pandemic and after because the services of our organization are uh, perpetual. So it never ends. Um, even when all this is over, the clients can come back to us and let us know what else they need. There are over 200 street vendors throughout Central Queens who are considered essential workers under Governor Andrew Cuomo's COVID-19 pause order. The vendors are doing more than providing fresh fruit and vegetables to their communities. They're providing crucial information about health and safety to the communities and customers in their own languages. Despite that effort, the inequalities they were already facing have worsened during the pandemic. The deputy director of the Elmhurst-based Street Vendor Project, Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, and Juan Carlos, a street vendor, tell us more. Es una situación que ha descontrolado a toda nuestra familia. Yo soy un vendedor ambulante. Usualmente trabajo en una escuela pública vendiendo afuera. Mi papá también es vendedor ambulante. Él tiene 70 años. Yo tengo 42. Ambos somos de México. Mi papá realmente trabaja porque necesita enviar dinero a mi mamá en México que tiene diabetes. Mi esposa necesita trabajar para proveerle para su mamá que tiene también diabetes y condiciones médicas. Los clientes son básicamente latinos, la mayoría o más del 50% son mexicanos, dominicanos, puertorriqueños y latinos en general. Muchos de ellos han perdido sus trabajos, ambos miembros de la familia. No tienen dinero ni siquiera para la renta, menos para comida, menos para un helado. This pandemic has hit so hard, not just because of, of language barriers, but because of the compounded effects of broken immigration system uh, that, that penalizes people for not having access or a pathway to citizenship. Um, because of broken labor systems, which create barriers for people who are either cash economy workers or are day laborers from a, receiving any benefits that would meet their needs, like in, unemployment insurance, hazard pay for continuing to work. None of that exists for, for undocumented communities. Lo primero que hicieron fue cerrar las escuelas. Sí, y al cerrar las escuelas, eso representa casi el 50% de los ingresos en ventas que tenemos diariamente. Lo siguiente que pasó fue que si nosotros salíamos a vender policía o sanidad nos podía dar un ticket de hasta mil dólares, nos podía quitar el, la mercancía y podía quitarnos hasta los carritos helados. Entonces yo vi realmente que la situación se estaba poniendo muy tensa. There are 780,000 undocumented New Yorkers. Everyone is excluded if they don't have a social security number from receiving um, benefits through the federal stimulus package. Um, through through the CARES Act. And so this creates a situation where some people are getting $1,200, which in itself is not enough. And then others are receiving nothing. And that is a disgrace. And that is direct discrimination. And that is an attack on immigrant communities. Yo paré de trabajar en la primera semana de marzo. En este caso, a mí como inmigrante, no tengo ninguna ayuda de parte de la ciudad. Entonces, eh, la situación es que el gobierno no, no nos está apoyando con nada. La única ayuda que yo estoy recibiendo es, por ejemplo, de organizaciones comunitarias. Yo estoy yendo a buscar comida eh, dos días a la semana, una vez al mes. Con eso nosotros hemos podido sobrevivir. There's, 
tons of ways to jump in um, and be supporting folks who are excluded. We have a number of demands. Um, the first is to, for New York City or for New York State to create a fund for individual payments for New Yorkers that have been excluded from the stimulus package. And then for folks who are in a position who may be salaried or in receiving and have a social security number and are receiving um, a stimulus check, we're asking for folks to redistribute that check to, if they're in a position to, to folks who are, who are excluded. New York City has spent an estimated $40 million on this year's census. According to Mayor Bill de Blasio, it's the biggest investment by any U.S. city. That's because there's a lot at stake this year, including Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's seat in Congress. Amit Baga, Deputy Director of NYC Census 2020, tells us why, now more than ever, communities like Elmhurst need to fill out the census forms. So what we are seeing in certain parts of New York City is that some of the communities that are on the front lines of being hardest hit by COVID-19 are the very same communities that have either been historically undercounted by the census or really are not being able to fully participate in the census this time around. For example, Corona and Elmhurst, the general area, this is a part of Queens that is very heavily immigrant. These are the very same communities that are going to need as much support as possible when it comes to education, housing, transportation, and yes, of course, healthcare. And all of these things, the money for all of these important programs and services is dependent on the census to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So if we want to ensure that New York City gets its fair share, not just of hospital equipment and healthcare today, but all of the things that we are going to need to be a stronger, better city tomorrow, we need to have a complete count in the census. New York City has historically not performed as well as the parts of the country in the decennial census. In 2010, our initial self-response rate here in New York City, which measures the number of households that self-responded on their own to the census, was just 61.9%, whereas the national average was much higher. Here in New York City, there have been a number of communities and neighborhoods that have been undercounted by the census. And this is for many different reasons. Well, there's me and my husband, William H., and our two sons, John J. and William H. Jr. The census, even though it has been conducted every 10 years since 1790, is conducted by the federal government. And many people here in New York City, many communities here in New York City, understandably have a lack of trust in the federal government. This distrust, of course, has existed for hundreds of years. And in the last four years, given the type of rhetoric that we are all hearing coming out of Washington and the White House, it's become very challenging for lots of communities, particularly communities of color, to feel like they can trust the federal government. Now we have the great work to do to undo the damage of that fear, cross that barrier, and ensure that immigrant communities participate fully in the 2020 census. We have multilingual advertising that is geo-targeted to these neighborhoods that can be found on social media, as well as dozens of websites that are consumed by immigrant communities for news and information. And we also have many advertisements running on television and radio in several different languages. No matter what anybody tells you, immigrants with or without papers count too. Mi gente presente. The census went live on March 12th of this year. You were able to go online to my2020census.gov or call one of 12 different phone numbers for 12 different languages and complete the census. It takes just a few minutes, just 10 simple questions, and you'll be done. All you need to know is your address. That's it. We've heard from many New Yorkers that perhaps they haven't gotten a reminder or a letter in the mail. That is no problem. You don't need a unique code. You don't need any other information other than the address of where you live, including your unit number. This is very important for neighborhoods like Elmhurst and Corona, where we know there are many, many hundreds, if not thousands of housing units that have basement apartments, many of which are in fact illegal basement apartments. 
As far as the census is concerned, that is absolutely no problem. Census responses are by law 100% confidential and cannot be shared with anyone, not with any other government agencies, not with immigration, not with the police, not with the city of New York, and not even with your landlord. So we say to all New Yorkers, no matter what your housing situation is, no matter what your immigration status is, the census is for you. All you need to do is go online to my2020census.gov, type in your address, and you'll be able to submit your form completely confidentially. That's our show this month. Thanks for staying tuned as we explored our diversity. Until the next time, I'm Zyphus Lebrun.